We're back. I hope you've enjoyed your first course. For those of us that come from Australia, that music you would have thought was the music they use when they do the brown low medal count for the AFL football. But that's in another world, in another place. Right now, I suspect many of us are thinking of a game of cricket that's down the road at Lords, and it's evenly poised. Let's see how that one goes. But we're back, uh, ladies and gentlemen, members and guests. You might have noticed our photographer, Carly Adby, is wandering around the room. She's been busy taking photos. And those images of tonight's events will be available to you on our website gallery. You will also have seen a slide giving detail of our industry's Australian conference, uh, IMARC, which is timed later this year from the 31st of October to the 2nd of November. On that area, there's a QR code, so it should help. We, it's a very big conference in Australia, and it's certainly standing tall across the world. So, members and guests, if I could have your attention, please. It's time for our fireside chat with Glencore's CEO, Gary Nagel. Now, on one side of that chat is the natural resources editor at the Financial Times, Leslie Hook. Now, before I introduce Leslie, I can hear some strong chatter up that area. You pointed out, thank you very much up that end. I think we're good in the rest of it. Great, good, better. Leslie is an award-winning journalist. She has reported from more than a dozen countries across Asia and Europe, and today leads the Financial Times coverage in commodities, mining, and energy. Her previous postings include Environment Correspondent, San Francisco Correspondent, and Beijing Correspondent. And prior to joining the FT in 2010, Leslie was at the Wall Street Journal and the Far Eastern Economic Review. She was also the 2013 and 14 Fellow at the Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard University. So members and guests, please welcome Leslie Hook to the Melbourne Mining Club here in London. I would now like to welcome to the stage the Chief Executive Officer of the London Metal Exchange, Matthew Chamberlain. Matt has the honour of introducing our keynote guest speaker. Please welcome Matt to the stage. Thank you so much, Gavin, and it is indeed uh, an honour to be able to make the introduction and for the LME uh, to have the privilege uh, of sponsoring this evening. I think uh, everyone knows this has been uh, a challenging year in our history, uh, but one thing that we have really appreciated is the ongoing uh, support and friendship uh, of the physical market, including so many of the people uh, who are here this evening. Uh, and so I'm really excited uh, to be here. I'm really excited to have a, a front row uh, seat for uh, what I think is going to be a fascinating uh, conversation between one of the best uh, journalists in our, in our space and one of the most interesting leaders uh, in our space. Uh, and so I will uh, briefly introduce Gary. Uh, Gary Nagel joined Glencore uh, in, tw in 2000 in Switzerland as part of the coal business development team. He was heavily involved in seeding a portfolio of assets to Extrata in, tw in 2002 in conjunction with its initial listing on the LSE. Gary worked for five years in Colombia as CEO of Prodeco, and he then moved to South Africa to be head of Glencore's Ferro Al Alloys Assets. Following that, he was head of Glencore's Coal Assets, based in Australia. He was a non-executive director of Lonmin uh, from 2013 to 2015, and has represented Glencore on the Minerals Council of Australia and Colombia. Uh, Gary uh, has commerce and accounting degrees from the University of the Witwatersrand, uh, and uh, has qualified as a chartered accountant in South Africa in 1999. So, members and guests, uh, it has been a long time uh, in the making, uh, but uh, I think everyone here at the Melbourne Mining Club is absolutely delighted to welcome Glencore's Gary Nagel. Thanks to all of you for being here. After this chat, we're going to open it up for audience questions, so we also look forward to hearing from all of you uh, after, after we've spoken. Um, Gary, it's been a very busy couple of months for you. I mean, so busy that I'm sort of surprised you even have time to be here on stage when you could be having dinner with Jonathan Price or, you know, 
Jonathan was supposed to be here, so we could have had dinner together. Did he stand you up? Uh, I think he stood up the Melbourne Mining Club. He didn't stand me up. <laughs> Um, but I'd like to begin by asking you to set the stage for where is Glencore going with all of this? You tried to buy tech resources more recently, bidding only for the coal business. There's also the Viterra spin out. I know people in this room are, have been following these events, so I don't, won't recite them all. But what is Glencore going to look like when this process finishes? I mean, what Glencore looks like, we don't know, because not everything is in our control. What have we achieved over the last couple of years? Um, we've settled our, uh, some of our very large investigations, which has been great. We've sold off what we call some of our tail assets, or some of the assets which are subscale for us. Uh, the Cobar transaction closed last week. We sold Ernest Henry. We sold some assets in Europe. We sold some assets in Bolivia. Um, so we've really streamlined our, our business. We've also bought some assets. Uh, we bought the Adenorte or a share of the Adenorte uh, operations and the MRN mine in, in, in Brazil. Um, we've concluded a transaction for Vatera. Um, and we've obviously, you, you've mentioned tech, we've had an approach to tech. So we've really got the business into a position where we are, we have tier one, long life, terrific assets in the right commodities. We have the world's largest and best marketing business, and we have a v growing and very profitable recycling business, which sets up our company to be the go-to uh, commodities business in the world as we go forward into a decarbonized future. I want to come back a bit to tech and, uh, and also to talking about, about the trading business, but first I want to ask about the, the energy transition. I mean, a lot of these strategic moves that you guys are making are, on, and your interest in tech's metals business, for example, is premised on the energy transition. Um, and how is that feeding into this, this strategy and this, this vision? I mean, everybody knows and everybody's spoken about at, at length the shortage of metals in the world. And I mean, the ability for the world to achieve net zero is very challenged on the basis of a metal availability to the world. We look at copper demand today, copper demand's about 25, 26 million tons a year, and that needs to double over the next 25 years. So that's an additional million tons a year of copper that the world needs per year over the next 25 years. If you look back over the last 10 years, copper growth has been on average half a million tons a year. So we can see that the world is challenged to meet these metal uh, demand requirements for a decarbonized world. The same goes for whether it be electric vehicles and the need for, uh, for nickel and for cobalt in long-range vehicles. The, the metal doesn't exist. And the challenge that we have as a mining industry is to be able to bring these metals into the world, to be able to develop projects, grow projects, and be able to feed the demand as it comes. And do you, do you think that the, the challenges in meeting that demand will hold back or slow down the energy transition? Look, it's all our responsibility to ensure that we decarbonize as fast as we do, as fast as we can. It's a responsibility of everybody in this room and, in fact, in the entire world. But the challenges we face where we operate, the jurisdictions we operate, to get permitting, to be able to deploy capital, to be able to get uh, community consent, government consent, environmental consent, these make projects harder and harder to bring into the market. And shareholders as well don't want to see capital deployed unnecessarily. We as an industry have a history of poor capital deployment. So uh, there's a group of companies now with boards and, and, and management teams who are a little bit more nervous to deploy that capital unless there's more certainty around the demand, around the price, and around the ability to bring that metal to market on time and on budget. So I think it is a big challenge for the world to be able to meet these decarbonization goals um, given the, the, the outlook that we have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I want to go back to tech for a, a moment, because I know that's kind of the question on, on everyone's mind. Earlier this month, uh, you bid for tech's coal business, its Met Coal business, uh, for an undisclosed sum in, in cash. And how are those discussions with tech over coal going? <laughs> Look, we're, we're willing to pursue um, our initial proposal to tech, which was a larger proposal of merging Glencore with tech and then demerging the metals business and the, and the coal business. Um, at the moment, uh, that, and we're willing to pursue that. We've also proposed separately uh, a cash buyout of uh, tech's uh, met coal business, 
And uh, right now, we're engaging with tech on that. And I mean, you had previously said that just getting tech's coal business would be a distant second compared to the first prize, which was all of tech resources. Do you still feel that way? I mean, are you settling for the second, second prize here? Uh, the tech coal business is a very good business, and right now we're going to engage with tech on their coal business. <laughs> And, and if you're suc successful... See, Jonathan deal, should have been here. Yeah. <laughs> if you're successful in this deal, what would this new coal giant look like? I mean, it would, it would, you guys are already one of the largest coal companies in the world, the biggest coal exporter, but it would it'd be even bigger. I think a million tons of thermal coal, 30 million of met coal. Um, what, would this, what would this new entity kind of look like? I mean, we've always said, and, and it was the premise also of the original proposal to take on the uh, larger uh, merger, demerger, is we create what is definitely would be the world's best coal company. It would be a coal company that has assets in Canada, it has assets in Colombia, it has assets in South Africa, and it has assets in Australia. And it would also be represented across the different qual uh, qualities, uh, large steam coal producer, um, even ourselves, we're large coking coal producers, and people forget that we produce 13 million tons of coking coal, 7 million tons of semi-soft coking coal. So as Glencore alone, we're already close to 20 million tons of, of met coal. And then you add in the met coal business that comes, that's in the tech portfolio right now, and you put those all together with our portfolio, you, you simply have the world's best uh, seaborne export coal business. And, and how does this potential growth in coal stack up with your climate commitments. Glencore has a goal to cut emissions by 50% by, I think, 20, 2035. Um, and I think under your predecessor, the company also pledged to cap its coal production at 150 million tons a year. Is that all going to line up with this big expansion in coal? Yeah, Glencore has its own responsible rundown of its coal business. So as Glencore, we've, we've committed to, of our 2019 base year, run down our coal business, so to reduce our production by at least 15% by 2026, a short-term target, a medium-term target of at least 50% down by 2035, uh, with a net zero ambition by 2050. That's our coal uh, climate strategy. Tech have their own climate strategy around the met coal business, and met coal is different to steam coal in terms of uh, its application and the ability to decarbonize. Our intention is when we do spin out, assuming we are successful in, in acquiring Tech's coal business, our intention is that the new coal business would inherit and take on our climate strategy for the steam coal business, so to continue that responsible rundown, and to take on Tech's climate strategy with respect to the Met coal business. So still doing what's right for the world, what's responsible for the world, managing these assets properly, but also providing the energy needs of today as the world decarbonizes. So in that scenario, the steam coal would still be getting run down over time, but the met coal would not. That's the intention. And, and, and that's compatible with the existing climate commitments, including the 150 million ton cap. Well, the 150 million ton cap was something that was put in place many years ago, and it was, you know, we haven't come even close to that 150 million ton cap. Last, our guidance this year is about 110 million tons. Um, so we know we're near that. So that cap obviously applied just to the Glencore business, the new business would have a look at its own climate strategy, but as I said, our intention is, it, is for the new business to take on the Glencore's uh, responsible rundown strategy for steam coal and tech's current uh, um, climate strategy with respect to met coal. Got it. And I also wanted to, I, I, we'll come back to some of these themes later in our conversation, but I wanted to take a minute just to talk about yourself as CEO. It's been two years in the, in the role uh, this, this month, I believe. Um, and you joined Glencore when you were just 25. Did you ever think that you'd be sitting here? Did you ever think you'd have the top spot? No. I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody in the company, I don't know what, I don't know what it's like to work in another company because I've never worked anywhere else, but I mean, you get in the company and you work and you don't think about where you're going next until you get the phone call about where you're going next. So, I mean, I, th I think you could say that for, for all my colleagues sitting over there as well. 
Um, so no, I've never thought about the role until it came up, um, you know, during the course of the of the run up to to me taking over. Uh, so no, it wasn't something that ever crossed my mind. And how did you get into mining? I mean, you trained as an accountant, and were you already interested in the sector? Did it just kind of stumble into it? I had absolutely no idea about mining. Uh, my second day on the job, I went underground to coal mine in Australia. I was knee high in I don't know what, and I thought, what the hell am I doing here? This is not for me. Um, I had no idea, and from there, and I think probably most of my colleagues have similar, have similar stories. But, you know, the best way to learn is on the job, um, and we employ terrific engineers, terrific mining engineers, terrific geologists, terrific professionals, who, through that collaboration, you learn about the industry. Um, and that's how we, be, you know, sort of we become experts in what we do. And I believe you are the fourth CEO of Glencore in just 50 years, so there's some longevity in, in this, this role. Um, but I also wanted to ask how you differentiate yourself or your strategy from your predecessor. I mean, you and Ivan share a lot of similarities. You're both accountants who love to go running and work out and come from South Africa. And those may be superficial, but what are the... <laughs> I don't go running in Hyde Park with 20 bankers, so I'm definitely <laughs> different to, to Arvin in that sense. I mean, every, every chief executive of this company has been different. I mean, from Mark to Willie to Arvin to myself, and everybody brings a certain difference to the company. The one thing I think that every CEO, in my opinion, has recognized is that the company is always bigger than the person, regardless who sits in that chair. Um, you know, Ivan did amazing things for this company and grew this company. Um, he's left and the company's gone from strength to strength. And you could say the same to, about Willie. And Willie did great things for the company and Ivan took over from him and took it from strength to strength. So the key thing about our company and that everybody does recognize is that it is about the company, it's not about the person. And you know, all four of us have been very honored to be able to r run a company of this importance and of this um, uh, the, the excitement that we bring in this company. So it's an honor to be able to serve in this job, and I hope I can continue to take it from strength to strength, and I will do that in a different way to Mark, to Willie, and to Arvin, but never straying away from what built Glencore to what it is today, which is, con which is keeping and, uh, that entrepreneurial spirit, that commercial thinking around everything that we approach, a hard-running, hard-working, collaborative way of, of, of approaching things. And is that how you hope you'll be remembered as CEO? I mean, you're going to be making your mark, uh, you already are making your mark, you will be making your mark on Glencore in the, in the coming years, and is that what you want to be known for? I mean, my single job is to, I mean, more than my single job. I mean, I don't need to be remembered for anything other than I want to keep our people safe and I want to be a responsible operator that makes great returns for our shareholders. I don't need to be remembered for any of that. That is my job. And if I can su succeed in doing that, then I've done my job. One of the challenges that you faced as a, a new CEO is that within your first year in the role, Glencore settled with the DOJ, uh, pled guilty to bribery and market manipulation, and agreed to pay a fine of 1.1 billion uh, US dollars. Uh, what was that like for you as, as a leader, and how far along the process of cultural change uh, are you in terms of dealing with the issues that were uncovered uh, in that investigation? Look, I mean, it's never easy dealing with these kind of things, the allegations, um, and in fact, not only the allegations, the facts that came out through the investigation. It's very difficult to deal with these, but it's adversity, which I believe is what makes you stronger. And as a group, as a company, as a management team, as a board, as employees, everybody's looked at this, they've learned from it, We've gone out proactively to explain what's happened, to um, explain why it's an unacceptable practice. I mean, you don't need to be a genius to work out that it's an unacceptable practice. But the fact that we can learn from it and grow from it, I believe has actually brought us closer together as a, as a, as a company, as employees, and as a management team. So difficult to deal with. It's something that we put firmly in our past, but we will never forget and it will help define us, define us as who we are going forward to ensure as a company that we can prove to the world 
that we are a responsible operator, that we do do things the right way, that we do look after our people, we do look after our communities, and we can make a lot of money for our shareholders ethically and above board. And I think that cultural feel, that feeling of, of, of belonging within our company and doing good for our stakeholders is, is something which is very strong in the group. And oddly enough, having gone through that process of this investigation, the finding, the plea, the monitors coming into our company, it's actually brought us closer together and brought our culture into, uh, or, or you know, helped cultivate our culture into one of really driving hard for being the best at what we do in terms of operating, being a responsible guy, um, being a, a, the go-to investor or company that people want to work for, people want you to invest in their countries, whatever it may be. So I think culturally, oddly enough, it's actually a net positive. And you guys are still going through parts of that process. I think there's a legal monitor, sev several legal monitors that are working with Glencore for the next couple of years. What's that been like to have legal monitors in, in place? You know, the monitors have just started, and uh, to be honest, I actually cut, I welcome them. Um, they're a, a, good bunch of, uh, a good bunch of guys and girls, um, and it's great to have them in our company. And the way I look at it is, is this. The last few years, we've spent significant time and effort on a compliance and ethics program in our company, one that's multifaceted. It helps drive the culture. It helps drive the right behavior. But it, it keeps us in good business, and it keeps us away from anything that's even close to the gray. So it's, a, it's I believe, a best-in-class gold standard of, of compliance programs. As I said, it covers things like it's multifaceted. It covers sanctions, training, raising concerns, um, uh, agents, you name it, it covers everything. And I think it's terrific, and we've challenged it, and we believe it's robust and strong. So we now have these monitors that have come into the business who are there to test that program. And I say, bring it on. It's great. Let them test that program. Let them poke holes, and let's look for weaknesses. And if they find weaknesses, it's not the end of the world, because then we can make it even stronger and even better. So I have no issue with it. I think it's a good opportunity for us to make our business even stronger than it already is. And there's still investigations ongoing in the Netherlands and Switzerland. Should we be expecting anything from those? Yeah, those, you know, it's very difficult to comment on it, largely because the investigation timing is not in our hands. I mean, they're overlapping investigations. If it was up to us, we wouldn't be here tonight. We'd be with them there trying to settle this and, and put it behind us like we did with the, with the DOJ and the SFO. But um, so it's very, you know, I can't estimate timing because it's, uh, it's not in our hands. I wanted to turn back to the conversation around coal and climate. You guys had your AGM just a couple weeks ago, and about 30% of shareholders voted against uh, Glencore's climate report, which was uh, an increase from the, the previous year. Uh, 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 so more shareholders seem to be questioning the Glencore's climate strategy. Uh, why do you think that is? Well, many reasons. Firstly, I think a 70% approval rather than a 30% negative is how it should be looked at. I mean, um, when Erdogan won the Turkish elections 52-48, everybody thought that was a terrific result, and he won. When a politician wins an election 55-45, everybody says it's a landslide. Yeah, we got our climate strategy approved 70-30, and that's a problem. I don't get that. So, you know, the, the reading of these numbers, to me, I think, in fact, we got overwhelming support from our shareholders for our climate strategy. Now, yes, you did say it went from 24% against to 30% against. That's true. And a lot of the way these voting uh, structures are done, that's a very technical process. And some ESG person in, 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 in the basement in office number 27 gets the list, and they have to tick off 19 boxes, and if they can only tick off 18 boxes and they can't get the 19th box, they vote no. And, the, and everybody knows, those around in this room will know very well, that the fund managers probably have very little say in that. So we get to a situation where it becomes quite technical and is not necessarily voted specifically on the merits. What happened last year is we had 24% vote against, and under LSE rules, we have to consult with our shareholders, which we do anyway and we consulted, and the overwhelming majority of shareholders was very supportive of our climate strategy. Very supportive. Now, this year, 30% against, we will consult again. And should our shareholders have a different view? Well, ultimately, I work for our shareholders, and we'll follow what our shareholders want. But 
70% have already said they're very supportive of our climate strategy, and we will certainly ask those questions of those other 30 and find out what the issue was. Was If it was the 19th box, well, that's no problem to fix. If it's something more material, well, then we're ready to engage. So, that, so there could be changes in the climate policy between this year and next year ahead of next year's AGM to address some of those concerns? Well, there will be anyway, because what we did is we, we put out a, pl a climate change strategy for approval, and that was pro approved around 95, 96% of our shareholders. We then took it to a vote, a uh, update vote, which was last year and again this year. And we then committed every third year to refresh that climate strategy. So our, our climate strategy for next year will be refreshed in any event. So, and as part of refreshing that strategy, the input that we get from our shareholders during the consultation process will go into that. I mean, it is, it is I, th I think, one point that some shareholders that I've spoken to have made to me is that the you know, focus on the energy transition seems incompatible with the big expansion in Met Coal that, uh, that's, that's, been, that's, that's been discussed. And I'm just wondering how you, how you can reconcile those, those two things. Well, we're not expanding Met Coal. I mean, we're buying an existing Met Coal business. Those Met Coal tons are already in the market if we are successful buying that business. So we're not expanding. We certainly, we're just taking tons which are in a, current situ in a current company and putting it into a different company. So there's no expansion in terms of tons in the world. And I think, you know, reasonable uh, commentators and including the IEA all understand very clearly that there's a role for coal, both steam coal and met coal, in the world as the world decarbonizes. Met coal, because you can't, um, you can't uh, replace met coal with green hydrogen in, in, in the foreseeable future for the next 10 or 20 years. And steam coal, because steam coal is needed for provide, to provide the baseload energy needs of today as the world decarbonizes and rolls out uh, renewable energy sources. And we spoke about the deficit in metals in the beginning, and it will take some time for the world to roll those out. And while the world does that, Somebody needs to, or companies need to provide the, the energy needs of today, which comes from our very high quality steam coal. But it's in responsible hands, which we will run down responsibly over time. And I know at least, uh, I know one shareholder wrote to the board uh, last week uh, asking, in fact, for your, for your resignation uh, on the grounds of expanding in coal and, and also the, questioning the deal terms of of Viterra. That was a letter from Bluebell Capital to the board. Um, what's, what's your response uh, to, to that? Every shareholder's right to have their, can have their, their say or their opinion. I mean, uh, I don't know how many shares Bluebell have, but they're more than welcome to have their opinion. I know that last month we had our AGM and 99.5% of our shareholders voted in favor of me staying in this job. So, of course, they're entitled to their views. I think we only have about five minutes left, so I, I wanted to turn to the trading business and the, uh, and the recycling business. But starting with trading, I mean, we've talked a lot about mining. How, how do you balance this focus on mining operations and trading? I mean, they're very different businesses, and under some scenarios, uh, like with the, the uh, demerger through the tech deal, um, they could be, could be separated, in fact. You know, Glencore's trading operations could be separated from its mining operations. And I'm just wondering how your, what's your current thinking on whether mining operations and trading operations really go together? I mean, I wonder how the traditional mining companies don't have trading desks, because I don't understand how one is able to market the material that a mining company produces effectively without having some sort of trading business that provides for price discovery, um, price maximization, blending opportunities, arbitrage opportunities, freight arbitra opportunities, um, and the likes. And when you have a mining business together with a marketing business and a trading business that we have, the ability to leverage off each other, um, standalone each business would be uh, much weaker than putting them together. And the ability to leverage off each other is what makes us so strong and provides the super returns that we can produce for our shareholders. There's also been a lot of scandals in commodity trading this year. We had this uh, nickel, nickel fraud case with Trafigura. I think uh, a company that Glencore used to own, Access World, was also discovered to have issued 
warrants uh, to bags of stone that were supposed to be nickel that were, that were not. Um, why does this keep happening? Does, what is it about commodity trading that, you know, does it need to be modernized or what's, what's driving these repeated instances of, of fraud? I mean, that's a good question. I don't know. Look, at the end of the day, we're a regulated industry anyway, and more regulation is not really going to help. I think the fact is we bulk commodities. These are commodities that are, are needed, uh, required around the world. Um, and, you know, you do have instances of fraud or you have instances of, of, you know, in the Traffic Europe situation or the Access World situation where people broke into the warehouse and, and cut out the bottom of the bags. I mean, that happens everywhere. Um, so, of course, we all sit in this industry and we read about it and it's high value items and it's big volume and that's why it makes big headlines. But I think every industry in the world suffers from similar types of, of, of concerns. And one area where you guys have been uh, investing a lot is in recycling, including a recent announcement about plans to build Europe's largest battery recycling facility in Sardinia. Um, right now, recycling is quite a small part of Glencore's business. I think it's just 200 million or so of your EBITDA of 34 million. So it's, it's quite tiny. How big is it going to grow? How big is it going to get? The answer is, I don't know how big it'll grow, but it's going to grow big, for sure. I mean, you say it's small, and within, the, within Glencore, it is small. I mean, with $250 million of EBITDA in that business, very little capital, very little, um, uh, so very little tax, so it becomes virtually all, all cash. Um, but on that basis, you know, we still produce between 30 and 40,000 tons of copper a year out of that business. You know, that's the same amount of copper as the cobalt mine that we just sold in Australia. So it's a significant producer of what is effectively a circular metal. And what we're seeing now in the world and, and our customers asking us are coming to us and saying, hold on a second, before you provi provide us primary metal, do you have recycled metal for us? So we as a, as, a, as a mining company, a trader, as we said, when we go to a customer, we're able to offer our own primary metal, third-party metal that we've bought in from other customers, and recycled metal. So all of a sudden, we land up front of the line because we bring the full menu that our customers want. So where's the world going with recycling? Ultimately, we all have to recycle. It's our responsibility. We cannot not recycle. As, a, as mining companies, as mining engineers, and Mark will know very well, we love running around the world and digging big holes and, and, and you know, building all these big mines. But ultimately, we can't just keep doing that. Our responsibility is also to recycle. And as we grow and the demand that we talked about, the amount of metal needed, we have to start looking at recycling. Otherwise, we will never meet the needs of the world's demand for metal. It's impossible. So as we grow and as you see the amount of, of, of e-waste, the amount of battery scrap, and as electric vehicles get scrapped in eight or ten years' time, as those come into the system, the amount of uh, material for recycling will grow exponentially. So what are we doing as Glencore? We're setting up all these joint ventures, all these partnerships, all these assets, all this infrastructure, all these networks. So yes, it is small now. You're right, $250 million, 40,000 tons of copper. That doesn't sound big. But when the big wave of material comes, we will be primarily set up to be able to take all that material into our network, process it, and re-deliver it back to our customers. And that will give us an advantage over many of our peers and competitors who don't have the ability to offer that full menu of, of, meta, of metals. And, and will we get to a point where we don't have to mine anymore? The world can meet its needs through recycling? Well, I hope so, but I don't, don't think in... Um, that might be bad news for a lot of people yeah, in this room. I think everybody's job's safe for some time. I don't think, uh, <laughs> I don't think for the next, uh, for a long time. One final topic I wanted to ask about is how you see the capital markets. You guys are listed in London, and you mentioned that uh, if a potential coal co, new coal co created through the tech deal could be listed in New York, perhaps, because it was more receptive. Uh, how do you see the relative merits of being London listed versus being New York listed at the moment? Where's your thinking on that? Look, we chose New York specifically for the coal company because we don't believe that the ESG criteria needed from investors on the London Stock Exchange will be met by a coal company. Um, in the road shows that Steve and I do, we spend a lot of time in Europe, we spend a lot of time in the US, and there's a clear difference in investor sentiment towards um, ESG and, and, and in fact, returns. 
The US is more focused, and I'm not saying it's that they're anti-ESG, but they're more focused on returns on investment. And there's so many big pools of capital in the US that are chasing yields. Now, when we go and we see these, these investors, they're very excited to see us because they see the yield on our coal business, but associated with that, they're very comfortable with the fact that we're a responsible operator and our responsible rundown strategy. So American investors, in my view, seem to take a more uh, pragmatic approach towards it, where they want the yield provided that it's done responsibly, where in Europe, uh, investors seem a little bit more focused on ESG, and it seems to be the ESG desk that makes more decisions, and returns are somehow put second or third in the list. And that's a concern for us, and why we believe the best place to put the, the coal business is, is uh, listed in, in New York. What about, what about if that deal doesn't go through, if there is not a demer demerger of the coal business, but even for Glencore itself, as it exists currently, would you ever consider listing in New York or moving to a listing? I mean, that's not something we're considering now. I mean, you can never say never to, to anything. Um, but, you know, the fact is, as I say, our coal business is running down and we're growing the metals business, organically and inorganically. So we meet a lot, uh, we meet huge, uh, a, a lot of criteria that the European investors want. Uh, they're very happy with our, our metal strategy, the fact that we are supplying these green metals into the world, into the decarbonisation industry. But if we're in a situation where we feel that we're not getting the recognition and we're not getting the valuations and we're not getting the pool of capital uh, for us on the, on, on, in London, it would be something that we would uh, potentially consider, but it's certainly not something that we need to consider now. Got it. Well, I want to leave time for a couple of audience questions. I think we'll only have time for three or four audience questions. And uh, Gavin, I'll hand over to you. There should be mics roving around the room, so. Sam, we have here, and Robert up at that end. So uh, let's start here. Um, yeah, I'm Christopher Eccleston from Hallgarten and Company. Um, it has been said that uh, the merger demerger is bad for Canada. You care to elaborate why it might be good for Canada? I'm not sure who said it's bad for Canada, but um, what I can say is let's look a little bit about Glencore's business in Canada, and I think that's, that's important. Glencore is one of the largest critical minerals producers in Canada. Certainly, uh, Valle is a very large critical mineral producer, and Mark's over here tonight, and Glencore is one of the largest critical mineral producers in Canada. We produce in Canada large amounts of nickel. We're the biggest cobalt producer in Canada. Uh, we produce copper in Canada. We have the Horn Smelter, which is North America's largest e-waste and copper scrap recycling business um, situated right there in Canada. So in terms of critical minerals, we have a very large footprint um, that we produce there in, right there in Canada. In those operations, we employ over 9,000 people. We have uh, agreements with all our First Nations across our industry in Sudbury, in Raglan, and across our businesses. Um, so we're a very good corporate citizen. We have a very strong history of uh, acquisitions in Canada, um, uh, when Extrata bought Falcon Bridge, when Glencore bought Viterra, and we went through the process of the Investment Canada Act. And the Investment Canada Act, which is a, a, a very good piece of legislation, is all about net benefits for Canada. And as Glencore, we agreed the, the suite of obligations that we have with the government of Canada at the time, and as we would, we met every single one of those obligations and more. So our, uh, our track record in Canada is terrific. We've done huge amounts of investment, social investment. Uh, obviously, we pay our taxes and royalties as one must, and the, the value add that we bring to Canada is shown in our track record. Okay. Uh Question that side, question here. You want one, right? Okay, Rob, there's one down here. While we're doing that, I've got a question. Uh, our governments have looked at, said, um, right in many places, net zero by, you know, 2050 and others. Have our governments consulted sufficiently with our minerals industry to see if we can actually supply the critical minerals, including copper, uh, so that we can meet our governments and our communities' stated targets towards net zero? The short answer is no, they haven't. And in fact, in many cases, governments make it a lot harder. 
We've seen how governments change legislation, um, whether it be more difficult to, to get licenses, uh, whether it be around changing fiscal terms um, and the like. So certainly they haven't consulted and I believe the playing field is in fact getting a lot harder because of changes in government's um, policies towards development of critical mineral assets. Thank you, Gary. Please, Phil. Yes, Philippe Loffer, Dassault Systems. Um, we are providing uh, solutions for creating digital twins. And the question is uh, decarbonation, net zero. So in order to reach that, there will be a profound transformation, several trials to be made, looking like a crystal ball, if you wish. Um, so we see manufacturing industries that are betting on virtualization. Do you believe it's a trend in the mining industry? And where is Glencore going there? A trend to? To virtualize, you know, to digital solution, to model and simulate the future. Yeah, I think, look, the one thing about the mining industry is we're not good at technology. Um, you know, it's the funny thing. If you go, go to a mine probably 20, 30, 40 years ago, it looks exactly the same as it does today. Just the trucks are a bit bigger. That's all we've done. I mean, you can go drop a bomb in Afghanistan using this, which you couldn't do 30 years ago, but, you know, we're slow movers as an industry, and we haven't, we mine in the same way. We haven't, we haven't, don't have that step change in technology, and it's up to us as an industry to try and embrace technology. We should be doing that, and investing in whatever it may be, whether it be AI, whether it be big data, whether it be twin digitization, we should be doing all these things because not only will it help uh, or accelerate our progress towards decarbonization net zero, but it'll also make us a better industry in terms of safety for our people, the ability to extract the minerals that we need to do, um, environmental management, stakeholder management, community management, and the likes. So it's up to all of us to invest further in it. You're quite right. We have one last question. We don't have one last question up there. There's time for one more question. There's one way down here. Sam, can you make the distance? Let's, let's, get, no, let's get that microphone. Rob Kennedy, can you get that microphone down there, please? Oh, Sam's got it. Snuck in from left field. Sorry about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask a question about the sort of long, the long sight uh, vision of where metals and minerals might come from. And I wonder what Glencore's position on deep ocean mining might be, where you know, obviously there's huge resources there on the ocean floor, and whether that's kind of being considered in the portfolio of assets that might be looked at. No, we're not considering deep ocean mining at all. I mean. Um I see recently that Norway have, have started to explore and do deep ocean mining. Okay, they, may, they can do that. It's not something that Glencore uh, intends to do. We don't see any legislation around it. We don't see any uh, um, policy around it. And without that, it's not something we would consider doing. Well, I think we may have to end on that note. Uh, thank you so much, Gary. And thanks for all your questions. Please join me in a round of applause for Gary. All right, okay. Members and guests, please. So, thank please. you, Gary. Just a few more moments, please. Two minutes, two minutes. Come on, everybody, just a few more moments. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Leslie. I liked your description of creating the world's best seaborne met coal business, potentially merging tech and Glencore assets. Met coal is one of the many commodities needed for the energy transition of the future. We're going to mine these commodities. We need these commodities, so let's be the best. Members and guests, please join me and Rebecca in thanking Gary Nagel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. That's for Gary. Yep. Yes, yes, open it and hold it up for the cameras. There we go. Well, Jonathan. Here we are, everybody. <laughs> uh, 
far. And uh, that is for you, Gary. Right, right. Thank you. Perfect. And that's, that's for better. Leslie. And thank you. thank you very much, Leslie. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Right. right. Thanks. Thanks. Members, yes, I promise you that that was the end of the formalities, and it is. Your main course is now going to be served. Please enjoy your main course and the rest of the evening. Have fun. Thank you.